Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good, after good afternoon. For me, it's a pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Roberto Giacobazzi, professor at the University of, of Verona. So you know Roberto as a, one of the most important researchers in static analysis and uh, in uh, abstract interpretation. He's famous for the work with Francesco. We'll give a talk on Thursday on a domain theory in uh, abstract interpretation, in particular in the concept of uh, completeness. And he's also famous because he was my very first professor at the university, the one who taught me about the data verification weakest precondition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he is young because it was not so long time ago. So. <laughs> no, just kidding. So, uh, relatively young, yes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, back when I was at the University of Pisa, and then he moved to the University of Verona. And, yeah. And uh, I had him for one year, and he never talked to me about abstract interpretation. And then well, we found ourselves later. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Francesco. Thank you to all of you. So today I will try to introduce the notion of completeness and incompleteness in absent interpretation, but I will make it uh, in such a way that uh, the interpretation of these two notions will be more in the language-based security than in program analysis. But I think that the notions are basically the same because it is about the precision of an abstraction, the precision of a procedure that tries to learn what the program does. And what we will see is that uh, Changing the program in order to make uh, this analysis imprecise is like obfuscating, hiding information. And refining the analysis in order to get the information from the program is like attacking the code. So these two, the battle between this rat and cat is exactly the same battle that happens uh, in security from the language base approach, of course. The scenario, quickly. So, well, this, may, doing this slide here is like uh, saying something obvious. I mean, there is a, a line that goes towards mainframe to ubiquitous. And this makes uh, things uh, in a context where typically you cannot always trust the environment where your program runs. So the standard crypto assumption is that uh, the perimeter of defense is... Uh, around the software of Alice, around the software of Bob. They try to communicate, and the attack tries to listen into the middle. So I want to hide the information, but I cannot hide the fact that the message exists. Indeed, crypto doesn't hide the fact that the message exists. It hides the contents of the message. I will try to interpret completeness in completeness, namely precision of analysis, in a context of which is called white box attack or white box cryptography, which is more related to the ubiquitous uh, nature of software in, in nowadays. The fact that Alice produces uh, informa her information, but um, she cannot trust completely the fact that Bob will run that uh, being Bob first, and secondly, that the environment to that Bob use is tr can be trusted. So basically, I, I will be in in the context of having a man-at-the-end attack. When Alice delivers his software, the software, at the end there can be somebody that tries to make completely reverse engineering and crack the information that uh, the, the program contains. So this is the, the context where we try to approach. And this is basically the, how, how these things are handled in reality. Namely, there is an, an adversary this is the asset that I want to protect. There is a sensor that tries to see whether it, this asset has been attacked. There is a control system that uh, activates a defense. This is typical in tamper-proofing, which is a kind of software that reacts to modifications, or in code obfuscation, watermarking, fingerprinting, and so on. Well, this has quite a value in the market. And the interesting thing is that, uh, and the in I think that this is the line of uh, my most recent research, is that trying to see whether behind these uh, different uh, bubbles there is a common path, background, which can be linked to the precision of the analysis by viewing the analysis as the process of attacking the code. 
And this is basically uh, the picture, because typically in, uh, in black box cryptography, we have an input output, but we cannot see much about the inside of the running of the code. We can weaken this, uh, and having the attack to the code more and more detailed about the running of internal of the program, in such a way that from the black box, we go to the white box. And this is something like making the abstraction of the, ana making the analysis more and more precise about the behavior of the program. This, uh, going through along these lines, correspond exactly to refine the abstraction. So basically, if I want to interpret uh, this, uh, no, this deep gray box crypto, white box crypto, and black box crypto, I can say that, well, this is a standard input out abstraction. That's the identity over the traces. So in the middle, there is different levels of uh, obscurity that I can have. And for each of them, there would be probably a reaction or a protection system that my code has to deliver in order to defeat that attack. I want to link these two. So I want to link the precision of the attacker with respect to the fact that uh, the program can be transformed in order to defeat that abstraction. OK, what is this for you? Looks like a picture at the beginning of the universe. The very early <laughs> seconds <laughs> in the universe, uh, if you look at the picture, looks like uh, much this. But it's not. It's a chessboard. So what's the difference between these two? This is abs absolutely obscure. <laughs> This, we, here we have information. What kind of information? Well, here we know the pieces on the chessboard, so we know how many of them, the type, and so on. The relation between these two has to be understood with respect to the eyes, so the perception we have. So the analysis is our view over this, is able to extract something, colors, shadows. Here, able to extract more. I want to use this uh, analogy in order to do the same on the, soft, on the code with respect to an analysis, which will be an abstract interpretation. So we need a model. And well, of course, it's standard model that we, you all know. It's uh, too complicated, too complex, undecidable. Google uh, showed us that it's not uh, recursive in general. So it's absolutely complicated. So this is a complete mess. And uh, well, we need abstraction. Abstraction means that the traces can be can be we don't have a precise definition of the each single transition, but we have uh, an approximation of this. And this has, should, should be computable. In this set, uh, we may have a loss of precision. And we all know that, for instance, if you take the interval of the maximum and the minimum in these traces computed, we get an interval that contains many spurious traces that doesn't exist in real execution. And, uh, well, we can make set up a logic on, around this and have uh, logic over abstract traces. And this was an interesting old paper that links model checking as uh, analyzing his model check, analyzing a project's model checking of an abstract interpretation. That was uh, an interesting old paper in Popol, I think, uh, in the 90s. And then we, we may it may have well happen that uh, we deal with the precision. Precision that, well, actually, we think that this is the interval computed, but in reality, the true interval computed in the end is much slow, much smaller than the interval computed by the analysis, which is bigger. So we have a loss of precision. Incompleteness means that the analysis lose precision with an error. OK, from um, the early definition of abstract interpretation in Cousot and Cousot, 77 and 79, there had been a flourishing of works that deals with uh, precision. Stefan, Mycroft, and then uh, myself, Francesco, and Francesca uh, tried to solve the problem once for all. And we proved that indeed it's possible to refine an abstraction for, with respect to any Scott continuous function, namely for any computable function, in the least possible way, in such a way to make it complete. And then we have tried to apply this little result to many aspects. And the language-based security is the one that we will try. The scenario that I've shown you is the area where I'll try to show this application. What are the ingredients? Of course, these are Italian's ingredients. So the ingredients are the standard one, abstraction. Abstraction, 
that I think most of you know very well. It's formalized, uh, I, form I use the formalization standard from uh, abstract interpretation, namely this pair of functions that take a concrete object, abstract into a property, and then concretize it back to something which is above, which is the error made in the abstraction. And this corresponds exactly to, look, to see an abstract domain or to see a subset of the concrete that contains only the points that represent the abstract object is perfectly isomorphic. And this means that basically an abstract domain is nothing else than a, an operation that takes a pro, an, an object, concrete one, maps into an, uh, someone which is above, which is approximation, and then stuck there because once you lose the formation, you cannot recover it anymore. This is an upper closure operator. So the lattice of all abstract closure operators is the lattice of all possible abstractions. And this is pretty nice because you can play there the game of transforming closures, which means transforming domains. So when you do this standard approximation, you typically inject an error because uh, you compute in the abstract instead of computing in the concrete. And the error you made is correspond basically to be sound but not complete. And the error can be propagated in the fixed point. And this is what happened typically. This would be the true abstraction of the true computation, while if you are computing the abstract, you get a, an object which is above, which is an upper approximation, an over approximation. Soundness means what? Standard soundness that we know is the following. Well, you typically have a function that computes from x to f of x. But in the, in the abstract domain, you don't have x. You have the property of x. So you have the approximation of x. Then you compute the function. And then you need to go into, into the domain of objects, of abstract objects. So you approximate the result. So in the, in the abstract domain, you compute this. In the concrete domain, you compute this. When the completeness ha happened. So in this case, you are sound because you are above then the approximation of the true result, which is this. If these two collapse, you are complete. This is called a black, backward completeness. Namely, by approximation, the input, you don't lose precision in the computation. Typical example, you have rule of sign. Rule of sign is complete with respect to multiplication, but is incomplete, doesn't work. Uh, it's sound, but not complete with respect to addition because you lose the magnitude of numbers. So once you have a positive and a negative, you want to multiply them, you got exactly a negative. But if you made the addition of the two, once you have lost this, the magnitude of the number, you don't know anymore who was prevailing of the two. So you, you can only say, I don't know, you go above. Forward completeness is perfectly the dual. So in this case, instead of looking if you lose precision by approximating the object in the input with respect to the, what is computed, you see whether you, you lose precision in approximating the output. So you assume that the input is abstract, and then what's happened is that you simply you are incomplete when you have an error between abstracting the output or having the concrete output. It's perfectly dual. Look at this example. This is a classical example to show these two notions. This is a, it, being abstract and concrete is a relative notion, so you can be abstract of something which is more concrete than other, and so on. So consider that this is your concrete domain. It's a simple lattice of intervals. And take uh, this uh, abstract domain. This is an abstract domain with the red bullet. Take the square operation. The square operation is computed with the blue arrows here. Look, this domain that says, I don't know the number. It's, po it's uh, positive. It's uh, between 0 and 10. It's forward complete, but not backward complete. Why? If you approximate, be being backward complete means that you don't lose precision by approximating the input of the function. So if you approximate 0, 2, you get here. Then you do the square, you get here. OK? While if you don't approximate the input, and you do the square, you get it here. This is the error made here, made not backward complete. But it is forward complete. All these points are already the output of the function square, and they are all inside the abstract domain. 
So basically, if you look, being backward complete means contain the inverse image of the function with respect to which I want to be complete. This is linked with the Seeger algorithm that when it tries to refine the, the, the partitions, go backward by the precondition. The only difference is that we proved this in year 2000 and Clark made in 2002. <laughs> Sorry? Advantage of being forward back, backward complete, what does that give you in, with respect to the concrete semantics? The fact that uh, with respect to the approximation of the old computer, so if you, if you compute the, in the concrete and then you approximate the output, or you compute in the, in the abstract, you get the same. This is backward completeness. Well, it's uh, the, the top you can make. You cannot get it better. You don't have false alarms. With respect to the abstract Yeah. Conversely, there are domains that are, not, that are backward complete and not forward complete. And this is all dual stuff. So we can, what we prove is that we can modify domains. So any. Maybe it's interesting to, to say that uh, the trivial abstraction is uh, trivially complete both backward and forward. And forward, yeah. Of course, the concrete semantics uh, is, uh, is perfectly complete. We can modify domain, namely, this is a case of completeness. You see that the x uh, is approximated here, then computed and approximated there. So they, the two elements collapse exactly to the same point. This is incompleteness. When this happens, it means that there is an error here due to the approximation. Well, in this case, we can, uh, if, you, if you have an incomplete domain abstraction, you can make it complete by adding points. You refine your abstraction. Or eliminating points. You simplify your abstraction. Typically, in static analysis, we refine because we, we, we look for a more precise domain that is able to avoid false alarms. But you can also Avoid false alarm by removing information, which is simplification. But it might have more false alarm with respect to the concrete semantics. Mm, you don't have more false alarm. You, because you are complete, you, have, uh, you are less precise with respect to the property. You don't have any more the same property. You lose the property you want to look for. But you remove the presence of false alarms. But yeah, the property is, is the absolute domain. And this was proved, uh, well, actually it was from 98, but basically a backward problem can always be transformed in a forward problem by considering the inverse function with respect to it to become complete. Amazingly, we can also modify programs, not only domains. So up until, until now, we have a domain. We have a program, we want to refine the domain or simplify the domain to avoid false alarm for that program. But we can take the domain fixed and change the code, the program, in order to be complete for that domain. And well, it's possible theoretically. Basically, this is a case of incompleteness. And in order to become complete, you simply have to avoid that this, uh, namely, transform the function to the closest from above or the closest from below that uh, is complete for that uh, uh, abstraction. And this is simply, it's very easy because you can compose this with the, the abstraction itself or with the adjoint of the abstraction. OK, so how all this fits into the stuff of uh, security or, let's say, static analysis as a way for attacking code and code transformation towards obfuscation as a way for protecting code? We go back to the picture. So basically, what is uh, an obfuscator? An obfuscator is a compiler, or is a bad student writing code. Okay. Typically, you have your input-output. You want to keep your input-output. And you want a transformation that, from this code, that everybody can understand what's, what is inside here, goes there, that nobody can understand what's happening inside. This has to be a compiler. But True uh, hackers actually do not perform compilation. <laughs> they really add junk, uh, reorder code. Uh, they do very weird stuff on the, at the machine level. So the idea is that I want to, to see if this can be 
that this transformation tau can be systematically derived from the precision, in terms of completeness, of the attacker. And how this can be done. So the typical attackers use uh, IDA Pro, many tools like uh, all DGB and so on, uh, colluding attacks, uh, differential attacks. There are many ways for, for attacking code, for making reverse engineering, understanding how it works. And most of them use tools uh, that are based on the analysis. So the objection that, well, your way of viewing the relation between attack and defense is r strictly related to the analysis that doesn't consider the human capability of understanding code in the, in the attack is partly true because in reality for, big si for industrial size code, this cannot, the reverse engineering cannot be done without uh, a tool based on an analysis, which is a slicer which can be a debugger or whatever. So if you are able to defeat uh, an analysis, automatically you delay much the power of an attacker in understanding the, the behavior of the code. So this is the idea, basically. The malicious user has a lens, so he cannot really see everything, but can only see a portion, an abstraction of the execution. And the obfuscation wants to make this user, this malicious user, blind. So basically, the defense has to turn this into this, and the attacker has to do the reverse. And I will use uh, uh, some stuff made many years ago by Neil Jones. Indeed, this is a paper that we did together uh, last year. And, uh, and it's interesting because um, we said obs obscuring code is uh, compiling. Well, you can specify a compiler, at least at the level of specification, like uh, the combination of a specializer and interpreter. Because if this is your source code that you want to, to make it obscure, well, we all know that the source code is equivalent to the specialization of an interpreter with the source code. So and if you want to keep the input-output of the program, it's enough to find any interpreter of your language and a specializer for that and made this combination. But in most cases, you inherit almost completely the structure. So basically, if this is in clean, in clean, clear, this is clear too. The challenge is to make this obscure, namely to twist something inside here in order to make it uh, obscure. And link uh, the twisting of the object inside here to the power of the attacker. So look, this is a little program. This is another program that computes exactly the same. What's the difference between these two? Well, it's obvious. This is uh, the true code. This is the flattening of the code. If you take the control flow graph of this program, it's completely flat. And everything is handled by the program counter, which is statically here, statically written inside the program itself. So if you have a good specializer, uh, Typically, the specializer doesn't return you this. Is able to understand that uh, the program counter can be statically derived. So if you apply this equation, you get back to here. So how can I let uh, this equation generate this instead of that? This is related to completeness. I will show you how. So the attacker. I want to see, in order to understand this, we have to understand what is the attacker. The attacker is an abstract interpretation. So imagine, imagine that uh, you have the previous uh, approximation. You have uh, a function which tells you which chess are on the board. You have an, an approximation that takes an image and returns another image. For example, the, 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 the strange image where we cannot recognize uh, if it's a, the origin of the universe or if it's a chess board. This is an abstraction because this contains this and many more other images, of course. Then uh, you have uh, a function that counts uh, an upper bound of the number of different types of chess on the board. Here you have a case of incompleteness, because if you approximate uh, the image with this, so if you approximate the input, which chess can, is only able to say, well, there are probably so many chess, the old kind of chess over the board, black and white, so I can produce 12. While instead, if I have the true image, then I get 7. So moving from this picture to that picture is 
an incompleteness. And from the perspective of our eyes, it's an obfuscation. So does it work the same on the program? Yes. From my point of view, obfuscating is making an abstract interpreter incomplete. So the attacker is an abstract interpreter, whatever abstraction considers. And the failing the precision is like returning the maximum amount of, fa of false positives, may namely, basically failing in the capability of extracting the, concrete, the true information. Well, this can be simply proved by simple reasoning. Uh, well, well, basically, if you want to keep the input output, well, the transformed code has to have the same input output of the original one. You assume that an abstraction is complete, so if you compute the abstraction of the semantics, this is equivalent to compute the abstract interpretation of the program. So you don't lose precision by analyzing. Well, you obfuscate when uh, you transform the program in order to lose some information. This happens if and only if uh, the transformed code is incomplete for that abstraction. If and only if. So losing precision in transforming code is precisely the same as telling you that uh, the transformer program is incomplete for that abstraction. And uh, well, this happens also in static analysis because uh, if, you make, if you compile your code or transform your code, it may well happen that the same analysis doesn't work anymore in the same way. Because what's happening there is that the transformer obfuscated the analysis. Let's go back to the example of uh, rule of sign. The rule of sign is, uh, we said, uh, complete for multiplication. We all know it. So if you approximate the input uh, with the sign, you get precisely the sign of the output with no loss of precision. But it is incomplete with respect to addition. So if you have uh, a little program, which is one line of code that makes multiplication, how can you obfuscate it with respect to the rule of sign? It's very simple. You transform multiplication into an iteration of additions. You keep the same input output, but the static analysis, which is, of course, very poor, the absolute interpretation, which is very poor, is only able to see the rule of sign, fails in extracting the, code, the sign of the code. So this is a transformation that keeps the input output, but obfuscates the analysis. What we will try to see now is how to derive this transformation systematically from the property that I want to make obscure, blind. Well, we tried some with the, my little group, and we, saw, we observed that most tools used by attackers correspond to abstract interpretations. Profiling, abstract the memory over particular variables, tracing, slicing, monitoring, decompilation, disassembly. Are, can all be formalized as abstract interpretations. So if the, each of these is an attack model, is an attack strategy against the code, then I'll, I can derive from each of them a transformation of the code that makes uh, that attack blind. OK, how? We all know that good programs are well structured and have concise invariants. Obfuscated programs should, uh, should be very badly structured and uh, very ugly <laughs> invariants. Incomprehensible, or the, the, the best is that you basically say, I don't know what's happening in that program point. So this is a, a conflict between uh, being well written and obfuscated, of course. There is an interesting stuff around uh, the idea of deriving a compiler by specializing an interpreter. The following two aspects hold. The first is that uh, the program that you obtain in this way inherit the algorithm of the source code. So the algorithm remains basically the same. What changes the programming style, which is inherited from the interpreter. So when you have a, a, a code, you specialize an interpreter with that code, you inherit the algorithm of your source, but the programming style is taken from the interpreter. So if I want to make obscure my code, I have to twist the interpreter in order to change the programming style in such a way that the analysis becomes blind. So I have to derive a distorted interpreter. 
Well, from the interpreter, I have to move to an interpreter, which is distorted, but it's still an interpreter from my language. An example. Let's see this by two examples. The first is flattening. Flattening is a, a pretty well-established uh, technology for, actually, the very first, <laughs> I think, the very first patent around this was by, by Microsoft in 1992. So we go back, uh, and they were hiding in this uh, flattening the key for the use of uh, the program, such as for basically activating the code, because the order of the blocks becomes relevant in order to, to, to activate the code. It's an interesting pattern to learn. Well, actually, the technology of flattening is uh, m much developed. And uh, there was a, a company, Clockware, that now is completely absorbed by Erdetto in Canada, which is a um, multinational big company making security, that basically made around flattening the core, their core business. The flattening idea is the following, simplified. You have your control flow graph. You flatten it, and you have a dispatcher that decides which block goes into execution. Of course, all the complexity is moved from the control flow graph to the dispatcher. The dispatcher can be very complicated, can become uh, flow sensitive. Uh, so if you input some data, the control flow, the, the sequence of blocks change. For the same data, you may have a change of the control flow because uh, basically blocks are redundant and so on. But the idea is flattening. So it's very, it works very well with this, exa this example because if you take this and uh, you take the program that I showed you before, this is the original code, this is the flattened code. You have a case, the dispatcher here is very ba basic, it's basically the program counter. These two are exactly the correspondence of what? of the source program and the specialization of an interpreter with the co this code. Look at the interpreter. The interpreter is by itself a flattening, a flattened co flattening code because uh, you have uh, a fetch of instruction, decoding of the instruction, and go back to the same loop. How? Well, if I take this program, I specialize in a little interpreter for C, I don't get that because uh, the control flow here is static. So I can predict the next program counter perfectly. And once I predict the specialization, do a little parcel evaluation, <laughs> generate the true code. This should not happen, because otherwise I get back to the original code. I want to an obfuscated one. So how can I make it? Well, you take the interpreter, and if you force the program counter to be dynamic, so the specializer cannot understand, is, is forbidden for the specializer to understand and to analyze the program counter, automatically the specialization generates you a flattened program. So by specializing this interpreter with the original code, forcing the program counter to become dynamic, you get automatically a flattened program. Then if you, if you twist the interpreter, you add a very complicated, um, homomorphic encrypted function around the program counter, then you get a more, 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 more complicated way for flattening the program and make it more and more secure. But why this is true, namely, why making this dynamic is related and how this is related with the attack? Because this looks like a trick. I have an interpreter, I force the program counter to become dynamic, automatically it returns me the flattened code, where is the attack there? there is, we prove the theorem that says that you are forced to be dynamic if and only if you want to make incomplete a very simple abstract interpretation that is the one that extracts the control flow graph. So if you make a very simple abstract interpretation that forgets completely about the memory of your computation and simply extract the control flow graph, you make that incomplete if and only if the program counter is dynamic. So and then I move to tracing. Of course. And then you, you, you swap to another attack, and you try to make incomplete that attack. Why? This is the theorem. Namely, by extracting the control flow graph from the execution is equivalent to extracting the control flow graph uh, statically. So you are 
So your algorithm for starting the control flow graph is complete. So you don't lose precision, so you are complete, if and only if the program counter is not a program variable, is not variable, so it's static. That means that if you want to, to let your attack, the attacker here is the algorithm that extracts the control flow graph, which is static, and static purely. It's an inspection of the code. It can be easily extracted as an iteration of the code by a simple after interpretation that forget the computation memory. You, you don't lose precision if and only if that is fully static. Namely, if you want to make it incomplete, obscure, you have to make it dynamic. And this is exactly what you do in order to, to generate the transformed code. So basically, flattening is nothing else than distorting an interpreter by forcing the program counter to become uh, dynamic that makes uh, the abstract interpreter of extracting the frontal control flow graph imprecise. Is there a theory behind this? Yes. It's exactly the theory of transforming domains, making it complete, incomplete, and so on. I go quickly around this. Typically, you have an, a domain, and you have another domain. And if you refine for becoming complete, you add points, and you become more complete. For instance, Seeger refines the domain to become more complete. So you, have, you add points, and the domain becomes more and more precise. Here, you have many domains that may reach to the same point. So there are many domains that, once refined, provides you that domain as a result. Among all of them, take the most abstract, if it exists. When it exists, that corresponds to a kind of uh, compression of your domain. That once refined, gives you the target domain, which is this. This is the most abstract domain that once refined, gives you this. Yeah? Just a technical question. Why if it exists? It exists, isn't it? Because it's a complete lattice, the abstraction mm -hmm. of what you see also. No. When the concrete one is there. There are cases where it doesn't exist. For instance, uh, if the operation with respect to, you, to which you refine is negation, okay. you have uh, a square, you have one of its abstraction, you add uh, yes, yes, the other it. point, the other one adds the other point, but the most abstract doesn't contain no, none of them. It is complete. It is, it is uh, the two point lattice, top and bottom. It depends on the, it's a property of, of R. We started with Francesco many years ago, the property of compressible domains, compressible abstraction. For instance, if you have a disjunctive completion, which takes to the disjunction, the compression is the joint irreducible elements. So though it's a kind of flat graph, flat lattice that contains all the basic points from which you can generate all these disjunctions. Depend, it's a property of R. OK. okay. So basically, you have a function that refines, and you have an inverse function that squeezes the domain when it exists. Not always exists, in most cases exist. For instance, uh, this, is, uh, this is the lattice of intervals, this is the square. Then uh, we can build uh, this uh, little function uh, by considering this formula. So basically, if we remove the L, this is the, the, the respect, with respect to that function square, this is the squeeze of the original domain. Okay, so what we try to prove is that uh, this, uh, ref with respect to the function that is inside R, R is a way for completing with respect to the function F. This inverse is the one that uh, induces the maximal amount of incompleteness, namely removes all the relevant points that are useful for, for removing false alarms. So it's exactly what the, the, the contrary of what we do <laughs> when you do static analysis. But it's exactly what we look for if you want to make the analysis blind. OK? Let's see this as an, with another example, then I finish. Slicing. Slicing obfuscation is more tricky. Program slicing obfuscation. So program slicing, basically, you, you generate a program dependency graph. Program dependency graph, you have this little program. Then you slice off the, from this program with respect to the variable x and y and so on. 
And all this is statically derived from the program dependency graph. Take, for instance, this little word count program. Okay, you have number of lines, number of words, number of characters. Okay, you slice, the slicing criterion is the variable with respect to which you want to slice. This is number of lines. And you get out this slice. And if you have number of words, you have to get out this slide, slice. Okay, if you want to obfuscate a program slicing, what you should do is to return as a slice the old code. So the slicing algorithm is more precise, is, more, is, a, is able to have a sharp view of the execution around that criteria if the, the slice is small is in size. So if you want to obfuscate the program, uh, the code obfuscation, the, the, code, the program slicer, you have to make the slicer blind to the, its capability of selecting instructions. Basically, he has to return the old code as a possible slice. That means that it fails. Of course, I mean, if I try to attack a program and I use the program slicer to reduce the size of the code I want to attack, and it returns me the code at the beginning, it's completely a useless uh, tool for my, for my attack. OK, so how hackers do hackers? I mean, this is simple hacking. Do this. They add fake dependencies. Because uh, the program uh, slicing is related uh, with the control dependency graph, the program dependency graph, if you add dependencies then, which are fake, for instance, in this case, uh, you see that this is always true. This is always false. So there are instructions that relate variables, link, make variables depending with each other, but they will never be executed. Because the, the program dependency gap is extracted statically, as a, I would say, an abstract interpretation of the program, then the program slicer is unable to return a good slice. Indeed, look, it gets a much bigger slice for a number of lines and for a number of words. Too big a slice. Is this related with the algorithm that attacks the code, which is the algorithm that extracts the program dependency graph? Yes, exactly as before. Here, the transformation that adds fixed dependency is precisely induced by the algorithm that extracts the program dependency graph. Look, the algorithm of program dependency graph is an abstract interpretation of the semi where you forget completely about the, the state once again and uh, generates uh, the graph. OK, so what's happening here? If I formalize this uh, as an abstraction, what happens is that I, it seems very easy to prove, once again, an if and only if, uh, that says that the program dependency graph uh, algorithm is an abstract interpretation with respect defined by an abstraction, rho. And that abstraction is incomplete if and only if the code contains static, so not dynamic, dependence, fake dependencies, namely dependencies that are not, ex are not true in the true trace of execution. So dependencies that are not generated at runtime. time. OK, so it seems that uh, with these two examples, well, the theory is more general, of course. <laughs> it doesn't work for only two examples. Basically, what we try to do is uh, the following. We want to obfuscate a program means we want to make blind an attacker. The attacker from myself is, is an abstract interpretation. Warning, an abstract interpretation doesn't need to be static. Also, monitoring, tracing can be formalized as an abstraction. So also dynamic uh, attacks can be formalized by, a, by an abstraction. Also tracing, where you'd have, uh, in, when you have a huge uh, amount of traces and you make mining on this, the mining is related to some abstraction because you lose some information in order to extract some other information. Once you know this abstraction, no matter what, uh, for instance, take the compilation. The compilation you look for irreducible graphs in the code in order to reconstruct the loops. So how can you make it incomplete, the algorithm that extracts irreducible graphs? You jump inside the code with fake jumps. 
In this way, the code appears completely reducible, and the, it's, the, the decompiler is unable to reconstruct the original structure. Once again, this is a making incomplete an abstraction, which is the one that looks for the graph that are reducible. Disassembling. If you see the dis standard disassembler, they work perfectly in the same way. So once you are able to extract the abstraction, you can always build uh, the interpreter, the twisted interpreter, which is always a modification of the standard interpreter that depends on this abstraction and makes, uh, by this equation, the transformed code blind for that abstraction. The point is the following, that you can always find a better abstraction that defeats the, the obfuscated one, of course. But uh, look, Barak and others proved in 2001 that, complete, that obfuscation is impossible. So you cannot uh, universally obfuscate all programs. Rice, uh, in 1952, proved that analysis is impossible. Well, we all do program analysis for at least uh, 40 years. So it makes sense to do <laughs> obfuscation even though it's impossible. That's it. Okay, thank you. You might also, I mean, you could in, increase the power of the abstract interpreter, not just by changing the domain, but by, um, by, for example, unrolling that loop to begin with that might get rid of the irreducible part. Or the multiplication example that you gave, if you just do trace partitioning, you would actually get that one, right? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, so even if you stay for the same domain... Um, in that case, uh, what I would do, this is, an, uh, I would say, this is a line of research. We don't have the, the ending point of this, of course. What I would do that is try to, to um, specify the trace partition as a refinement of the domain. And then I use that domain for deriving the obfuscated code that defeats your tra trace partition. The point, there is, a, I, I agree with you that there is a, a, a rigidity inside this stuff that we always pass through the, the abstraction in order to construct the interpreter. But uh, I quite believe that the most refinement you can do of the interpreter, you can see that as an abstraction of the domain over a more standard interpreter, a standard interpreter like the one, the simplest one. Of course, if you look at dynamic refiners, like refining the widening uh, over on waiting some iteration before a threshold, um, that cannot be specified as Galois stuff. But it's a nice, it's a challenging stuff because uh, I think that also, for instance, in the, in the delay of the widening, it's very easy to find a transformation of the code that simply <laughs> delays more <laughs> the change of the variable in such a way that it, it breaks your, your refinement. So probably there is something even more general than the thing that we are looking at the moment. But we are pretty happy that if you take, uh, there's a book by Christian Kohlberg, some kind of Bible of all these uh, tricky transformations. <laughs> Most of them we were able to specify as an absolute interpretation. And for each of them, uh, the twisted interpreter were de was derived almost uh, naturally. Are you able to define new obfuscation techniques uh, using this model? Well, for so the moment, for the moment, for the moment, we we we, we, the we tried the, the, to understand. The, yeah, I mean, it was a kind of understanding the the instead of viewing uh, obfuscation as a trick that each time I think a new stuff I generate and then I think that I have a company of a billion dollar company in mind that uh, it doesn't work, of course. <laughs> we tried to derive a, a principle behind this. The idea is the now is the following. Is it possible to uh, compose uh, uh, in a kind of uh, crypto way very simple transformations in order to make uh, more complicated ones by composing in such a way that the order becomes relevant? So if you know the order of the transformations of the very tiny little transformation that you do, you are able to reconstruct uh, back uh, the original code. So the order can be exponential because you have exponentially many different orders among. And that's, uh, that would be an interesting stuff to do. At the moment, we always uh, try to understand the existing. I think, I think 
yes, in general, in principle. Questions? Uh, quick question. So, my understanding is that all this works because you get, as you got the Galois stuff, so you are just considering the static approximation. You are considering the best transformer. Best transformer. Okay, but you may not. It's not reality. Yeah. You always have, don't have the best transformer, you have widening, but you, you have some transfer you operation which are not. Yeah, you are if you the defeat, worst case, if you, you if the worst case, but if then if you defeat the best transformer, you will defeat any other. Yeah, of course, but you are the worst case, but yeah, say how how far is it in the worst case from the real case? Yeah, but from from my point of view, is that I want to def when I want to protect because it, from my perspective, I want to protect uh, against somebody that wants to enter to my house. So I want to pr if I am able to protect against the best. Uh, uh, Guy that can. You can protect it by just putting, you know. I'm, I'm, too, yeah, door yeah, I'm probably like too much. Yeah, pro door is fine. I, I, lock is I agree. I agree with you. I so agree. That's what I wonder. What do you, you have an idea? You, or you, 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 you can. Feeling how far it's, uh, you can probably uh, have a lower level of 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 obfuscation to defeat the true tools. But uh, from uh, my point of view, if I, if I compose, this is why I look for simple transformations. Because if I'm able to defeat uh, uh, basic attacks and compose them with respect to the strongest possible attacker, which is the best core approximation, then I'm pretty sure that uh, other attackers will anyway have trouble to get in. Of course, uh, you pay, uh, I mean, there is. You, 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 you yeah. It's too complicated. Optimization does not kick in, and then. I agree, it but the, the, it too much. I'm wondering if, if you know your attacker, you know, for instance, what is the yeah. dynamic approximation you do. If you know the widening is used. If you know the or widening, you can probably you can probably simplify this. Yeah. Consider that anyway. Most of this technology is used not for protecting the algorithm. Nobody wants to protect the weak sword because everybody knows it. <laughs> it's for protecting keys inside the, the program. And these are related to very small portion of the code. So even if, so you don't really to, to obfuscate uh, the whole code. You really to target a specific area of the code in order to let them, for instance, very hard to extract by slicing, very hard to understand in the control flow and so on. So you probably pay a runtime uh, slowdown of 10 times over that little piece of code. Computed over, a student of mine made a strange thesis that he made a, a dynamic uh, obfuscator that was encrypting code in Java, in Java bytecode. So by passing the type system, so it's very complicated. The slowdown was 10,000 times. But uh, he applied it in, in a, such a small areas of the code that the eventual slowdown was uh, less than 0 0.7. So it depends where, of course, I mean, if you apply it to the all, uh, it's a complete, uh, can, be, can be too much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.